Hello everybody, welcome back to the series of me recapping seasons of The 100. I beg for your forgiveness as I've decided to split this final video in two parts. I originally was going to do the final three seasons in one last gigantic mega video. However, upon re-watching all of them, I found the script to be quite big and probably a little too big for one video. So I did a poll on my YouTube community page and most people actually said they wanted me to combine seasons five and six in this video, but I'm gonna go ahead and go against that anyway because I feel personally that season five stands on its own and works really well on its own because of the fact that not only does this season essentially reset everything from the first four seasons, but the two seasons after this season really feel like it's been reset again. So this really does feel like the ugly middle sibling of this show. Not that it's a bad season at all. It just feels so different and I feel like the showrunners had no clue where they were going to go with season six while they were writing season five. I think they kind of just were like, well, we're out of ideas and we have this season that we've got picked up, so let's do something crazy. And season six is very crazy and I will point that out when I get to it. But right now I'm here to give season five its praise because in my humble opinion, which is always correct because I've seen this show like a million times, season five is a really good season of television. You could disagree with me if you want, but I believe that it's true. The season is full of character turns, much like season three was, but in this this season they feel a lot more justified because of the six year time jump that we are dealing with here. Also the stakes have genuinely never felt higher despite the fact that last season was the literal apocalypse. I love it when TV shows get you to hate characters that you previously loved and get you to love characters that you previously hate. It demonstrates that they are able to quite literally change your opinion on certain things through character development. Once you get past the six year time jump and realize how insane it is, you begin to place yourself in the minds of these characters and their opinions and actions become a lot more justifiable in my opinion, particularly Octavia, who is technically the villain of this season. That could be debatable because we are dealing with like a whole new threat this season, which I will get to and I teased at the end of part two of this series. Octavia is the villain, in my opinion. Like, she drives the plot, her actions completely unjustifiable at times, and most of the characters are always at odds with her, or are holding back being at odds with her because of their history with her, because this is a protagonist. Like, this is a main character turning into the villain of this season. Usually when there's, like, a storyline where a main character turns into the villain for the season, uh, it has a tendency to not go so well i.e. Emma from Once Upon a Time. Obviously, this show is completely different where there are no heroes, there are no villains. Everyone is just a person that has their own motivations and their own reasons for doing things. Octavia's turn to the dark was such a big topic of debate in the fandom back in 2018. A lot of people believe that Octavia's character was going too far and that the writers were basically ruining her character by having her go to the dark, but I don't think that's the case at all because when you take a look at some of the flashbacks that they incorporate in this season, and they do have flashbacks to that six-year time period, all of it is justified. Like, I mean, well, some of it is not justifiable, but early on in the season, she comes to realize that there are too many people in the bunker and she has to make very big executive decisions to deal with such issues. I mean, she is literally 18 when she comes into power. I think most people forget that. She has just turned 18, which is insane if you're leading an entire society of people and you're 18 and all these adults are telling you what to do and you're kind of just like, yeah. And Octavia was never like diplomatic. Like she was never like the person that was lobbying for votes to be in charge. She just kind of found herself in charge because nobody else was going to do it. And she won the conclave. You really have to get in her shoes and realize that she is not choosing to be a leader. She was kind of just forced into it. But I'm going on a tangent, so I'm going to get off that now. Basically, after these six years, all of our characters find themselves in their mid-20s. Yes, mid-20s. They were in their late teens as of the first four seasons, and now they are in their mid-20s 
Bellamy is 29 as of this season. 29. I think the showrunners probably realized that the cast was getting older. They've been doing this for five years. They already look much older than they did in the pilot, so they have to age their cast up at some point. And their cast was already, like, in their mid-20s when they were filming teenagers. So now that they're all approaching their early to mid-30s, there has to be some kind of aging up going on, or else there's going to be literally 35-year-old men and women playing 17 or 18-year-old men and women. And that's just... That's giving Riverdale right there. I think this is one of the best decisions the show could have made at this point in its tenure, because if the show had just kept going without some kind of shakeup halfway through, I don't think it would have lasted as long as it did. The Hundred's willingness to shake it up every single season is very ballsy. I've seen some people comment on it, and yeah, it, it really is, because there's like, you just have to start all over essentially every single time. Sometimes it lands and sometimes it doesn't, but it's very ballsy for them to do that every single season. Also, very quickly before I get into the board, I do want to just mention that Echo is now considered a main character. I did give her a big picture back in season three, but she's now officially a main character now that she's been on the ring with like Bellamy and Monty and all of those girlies. So I did just want to preface that. So now I'm going to introduce you to the new characters. As for the characters, season five introduces us to a couple new characters, mainly characters on the Allegis ship, which I will get to explaining in just a moment, but we do have a couple newcomers who were a part of the clans, so let me get into those first, and then I'll explain the new faction up in the right corner. So everybody highlighted in this pinkish red color. I really wanted it to be like a dark red, but I couldn't find any markers that looked like that, so bear with me. Everybody in this color is a new character as of season five. First, we have Kara Cooper. She's a sky person who was uh, who came down in the arc, and we're just now meeting her, so that just tells you the levels of unimportance that were reached with her. Next. We have Brel. I don't know if she's a part of Tree Crew or if she's a part of Asgata or what clan she's a part of, but she is technically a grounder as of season five. Obviously, because everyone was in the bunker for six years, the clans basically all just became one, literally why it's called One Crew. She is one of the generals of Octavia, which I will get into explaining the character changes in a minute as well, but a lot of characters change. A lot of them change their opinions, their factions, everything. Next, we have Maddie. Now, Maddie, we were technically introduced to at the end of last season, but I forgot to print her picture out until now. Now, Maddie is obviously Obviously Clark's daughter and we were introduced to her in the finale of season four but I decided to make her a part of this crop of characters because I'm introducing her character here and now. A rambunctious little kid. Obviously we learned that she's a Nightblood in the finale of season four so that'll be interesting knowing that there is a potential new commander running around. It is a topic of debate in this season. Next we have Charmaine Dioza. Now she is technically like the leader of the people on the Allegis ship. These are prisoners on this this ship so she's not actually like in any authority it's more of like a militia that she's in charge of and then we also have Paxton McCreary who uh, has his own like section of people that he's in charge of it's really weird how they split up command next we have Miles Shaw he is the ship's pilot and we learn pretty early on that the entire crew minus him were all slaughtered by Dioza and the prisoners and they left him alive because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to fly the ship next we have Michael Vinson now Vinson he has some issues some psychological issues um, he is a serial killer I believe the first thing that we learn about him is to keep our hands and feet away from him so that's concerning that's all you need to know about him. And that's basically everybody that is introduced in this season. We have a whole new faction of about like 300 people obviously on the Allegis ship. However, we really only know like four of them, which is why I gave only four of them pictures. I also feel like it's important for me to explain the clans and how they've evolved really quick because I think I did a really bad job of explaining this during like seasons three and four when it's most important. From left to right, here are all the clans. First, we have Trishana Crew. The only member of Trishana Crew that we actually are introduced to is Ilian. And if you didn't know, Trishana Crew translates to Glowing Forest. So those are the people that live in the Glowing Forest. Like I said, we really only are introduced to Ilian. Now next we have Tree Crew. Now this is an important one because this is like the majority of the grounders on the ground. So basically from here 
all the way to here. These are all tree crew girlies. The sky people interact with them most because their ship landed in tree crew land and that is why we have so many relationships with tree crew. Now next we have Sangata crew and I'm counting Amori as Sangata crew although I'm not entirely sure if she is or not. It's not really specified. They don't really say Amori come Sangata crew or Amori come tree crew so I'm not exactly sure if she is a part of Tree Crew or Sangata Crew, but because she's in the desert, I'm gonna go ahead and take a wild guess that she is a part of Sangata Crew. These are the people that live in the dead zone or near the dead zone. She's like the only character that's important that we are introduced to. Next, we have Asgata. So we have Echo, Rowan, Queen Naya, and Amori. These are all of the Asgata girlies. This is the Ice Nation, so basically where Canada would be. Next, we have Flow Crew. Flow Crew are the people that live on the oil rig. My guess is that they have some sort of land, but mostly they live on the oil rig from what I've gathered. And finally, the last clan that we are actually introduced to, Lowata Clearon Crew, which basically means Shadow Valley. And the majority of this season takes place in Shallow Valley, which is Maddie's home. That is the valley that Clark will eventually live in with Maddie, although we don't really get to know any other members of this clan because they were either all killed during Prime Fire or absorbed into one crew. I'm gonna show you who is a part of one crew, then I'm going to show you who is in Space Crew. So I've highlighted everyone in one crew in this pinkish red color. Obviously Jaha, Kane, Abby all made it into the bunker. Octavia obviously is the leader of one crew, so of course she's here. As for the grounders that made it into the bunker, we have Indra, Nyla, and Gaia. And then also Miller and Jackson made it in. As for the Space Crew girlies, we have Bellamy, Raven, Murphy, Emori, Echo, Monty, and Harper. So I've decided to highlight Clark and Maddie because Clark this season kind of plays both sides and we'll begin to see her choose each side based on what will protect Maddie the most and what will benefit them as a mother and daughter together. And then finally, we have our four main slayers of the Allegis girlies. So we already know that a majority of this season takes place six years after the finale of season four. However, in the season five premiere, we get some flashbacks from the final scene of season four where Clark sees the Allegis girlies land. It's like two months after Prime Fire, we see Clark and she has escaped Becca's lab. And I guess she was buried in there and she somehow found a way to escape. I don't, they don't elaborate if the bunker collapsed on her. I don't know how she was able to escape, but we see her. She's in the middle of the desert. And if you remember, she got night blood last season. So that's how she's able to survive the apocalypse without a hazmat suit on. We see her begin a 210 mile journey to Polis where she can hopefully enter the bunker and live out these next six years with her mom. We see Clark find one of the rovers near the flow crew onboarding area. Clark makes it to Polis and it is a dead zone, girl. The entire city has just been completely destroyed, basically. The tower has fallen. I think I mentioned that in the last video. It's in ruins. It's in absolute ruins. So she's trying to dig her way into the bunker, but is unable to. And she digs and digs and digs, but then decides to leave so that she can try and find food or water at Arcadia. And when she gets to Arcadia, she finds the suicide note that Jasper left Monty. She doesn't read it, but she breaks down and starts crying. And girl is giving a performance this episode. She is absolute slang. This is one of my favorite episodes of the show, by the way. In the days following this, we see Clark hunkering down, trying to survive. She eats bugs off the windshield of her car. She's fighting sandstorms. Her car eventually loses power because the sandstorms destroy the solar panels on the car, which is what gives it power. So she's kind of out of options at this point. A few days later, Clark collapses in the desert. She attempts suicide after a bird gets away from her because she's trying to kill it to eat it. But the bird gets away from her, so she attempts suicide. And this performance is just too good. <laughs> But then the bird comes back and Clark chases it again and she runs and runs and runs up this like sand hill and she sees this amazing green valley which is obviously the green valley I mentioned earlier. We see Clark find this really colorful village which is obviously a part of Lawada Clearung crew. This is when Clark finally meets 
Maddie. Oh, I don't think you could see that. And Maddie, she is kind of a little devil child. So she runs away from Clark and Clark is led into a bear trap by Maddie. The next morning we see Clark draws a picture for Maddie and we see that Maddie learns to trust Clark, I guess. We then see six years later and we see Clark and Maddie living their life together. We see Clark and Maddie discuss whether or not space crew is ever going to come down or if they're ever going to get the bunker open. Meanwhile, up on the ring, we see our first look at the space crew girlies. We see Bellamy watching Eden, which is what he calls the shallow valley down on Earth. Echo and Raven obviously are now friends. Everybody on the ring are like very close friends now because they've had to spend the last six years together. So we see here on the ring, the girlies are surviving on nothing but algae soup, essentially, for the last six years. It seems as though Murphy has like barricaded himself to his own side of the ship and everyone else just kind of ignores him. We get the reveal here that Murphy and Amori are no longer seeing each other so that leaves one to wonder what happened in the last six years we see murphy looking out the window and he sees the allegiance ship which has launched a pod it's also stated here that the people on the ring these seven people do not have a way to get down back to earth we then see the scene again where clark and maddie watch as the allegiance land so as the allegiance door opens we meet colonel dioza we get our first good look at this group of prisoners we see that Dioza, she is the leader of them, although she's not technically formally a leader. We also learn here that the girlies are from our time, from the present day, and they were in cryosleep for like a hundred years. We see Clark and Maddie splitting up. Clark is going to go get as many guns as possible, where Maddie is going to hide because Clark is in mama bear mode and telling her daughter to go hide somewhere. So Maddie goes and hides. However, Clark shortly after hears a gunshot. So she goes and tries to find Maddie. However, Maddie is found by the Allegis girlies and Clark goes to try and save her. Clark is then getting attacked by the Allegis girlies. So Maddie shoots one of them. At the end of the episode, we see everyone on the ring packing to to leave in the rocket because Raven has a plan to take them to the Allegis mothership and dock with them in order to get the fuel that they need to get down to Earth. But before they go, we see Bellamy and Echo and it is revealed that those two are now dating. And I just wanted to point something out really quick because it feels as though the fan reactions to this were blown so out of proportion. Like everywhere you looked, there was hate for Echo. And yeah, okay, she was technically a villainous character in the first four seasons, but you gotta understand, six years is a long time, and when there's not that many people up in space to choose from, what did you expect was going to happen? Like, oh my gosh, people were so mad, especially Bellamy and Clark fans. Now, obviously, I am not a Belark stan. I respect Belark fans, but there were people literally sending her death threats for playing a character and getting romantically involved with the character that they wanted to see end up with someone else. At the end of the episode, we get our first glance at the people in the bunker. We see Octavia is sitting on a throne and there's like cages on the walls to keep people in. People are screaming, there's blood everywhere. So the people in the bunker are having such a good time. We're gonna get into that in the next episode. So the first like four episodes all take place within like a day. Essentially, there's a lot of flashbacks, but everything happens within a day. So I'm going to save showing you the timeline until like after episode four. So episode two focuses on the girlies in the bunker during the six year time jump. It is around the same time that Clark's story happened in episode one during like May of 2150. We see Octavia is pressured by Indra to wear the symbols of the commander. However, because Octavia is a red blooded commander, a lot of the clans are really unwilling to follow her because she does not not have the flame in her head and of course the grounders they obviously worship the flame octavia is not really supported by all of one crew it's essentially just her people and then some tree crew girlies support her as well although gaia is also a little hesitant herself obviously because gaia was a flame keeper she remains really hesitant to support octavia as well so we see octavia and the one crew council and one crew is not fully functional yet octavia is having a very hard time trying to get all these clans to trust her certain clans are mad at other clans for stealing blankets everyone is still very much in their tribalism era there's no 
unity here. So that's kind of just a quick summary of where the clans are now. There's unrest everywhere. And poor Octavia, she is just she's fed up with it, to be honest. You could tell she does not want to lead at all. Honestly though, who could blame her? We get a scene where the council hears the banging upstairs and it just so happens to be Clark when she's trying to break in in episode one. We saw that scene where she was trying to open the door. So Abby and Kane try to open the door from the inside, but because the tower fell, they're basically barricaded in. We see Flop Jaha is actually not being a flop this episode. Like he's kind of, he's kind of based just a little bit. Him and Kara Cooper, who I mentioned before, they warn the council about the fact that they do not have enough food for the next five years and that the hydro farm is not going to continue to feed 1200 people for the next five years. We also see that Kara represents a group of Sky people who are still very bitter about the um, culling, essentially, that was committed back in, I think it was episode 12 of season four, when Sky crew was given 100 spaces and they already had like 500 people moved into the bunker. So essentially like 400 people were killed because Octavia gave the executive order. Obviously each clan gets 100 people. Sky crew is no different. It's here that the council is kind of debating what they should do if they need to do population reduction possibly possibly if they need to go to half rations. Abby suggests that if they go to half rations, they will survive, but they will wish that they hadn't because they will be so small and malnourished that it's literally going to be hell. We begin to get the feeling that there are too many people in this bunker and the original like 1200 number that was projected before the apocalypse was a little too high. We learned that Jaha is taking care of Ethan. Now, I forgot to put Ethan on the board, but he's really not that important. He was the son of the guy, I don't remember his name, but he was one of the people who was tossed out during the culling. Hera and some of the other Sky people stage a takeover of the Hydra Farm, and basically most of Sky people are locked into the Hydra Farm so that they can sustain themselves and let everybody outside the door die. Where's everybody gonna sleep? Just like on top of each other? They're essentially just in this tiny ass lunch room and there's a hundred of them in there. The only Sky people that did not make it in there are Octavia, Jaha, and I think Miller was maybe locked out as well. I'm not entirely sure. Kane and Abby are locked up for trying to stop this takeover. Hera, she's just not looking too good. She's just, she's already planned a whole coup. There's leaving a thousand people to die on the other side of the Hydro Farm door. Because of the like 10 or so Sky people that were locked out of the lunchroom, we see certain grounders trying to kill Jaha because he is obviously Sky Crew. Octavia knows that he had nothing to do with it, so she saves his life. I also forgot to mention Jaha is revealed to have been stabbed, so he's bleeding out. Jaha and Nyla work together with Octavia to try and get the blast doors to open. Jaha is dressed up as a grounder, Octavia and him are in hoods, and they go down to, I think it's the bottom floor, I think it's like some kind of control room, to um, open the doors manually. However, Jaha refuses to help Octavia until they have some kind of heart to heart. He apologizes for floating her mother and locking her up for literally being born. I think that that should have happened a long time ago because she didn't do anything. He also criticizes how she is leading her people, saying that there's no room in this bunker and that there has to be some kind of population control. And Octavia, who just wants everybody to be happy, she's not ready to hear this. So he basically brings up the fact that they used to float people for having a second child, for doing anything illegal past the age of 18. He says that she needs to enforce the law a lot harder and like start killing people because it will make room for the rest of the people. A Little bit of a red flag if you're taking political advice from Jaha. We also get a scene where Abby remains pissed at Kane for saving her life last season when the culling was happening. She wanted to be tossed out, I guess, for some reason. I don't know. It's always something with these two, I swear to God. We get a slayful scene where Octavia has to go upstairs and kill a bunch of grounders because they are obviously trying to start a riot, so she needs to try and calm them down, and the only way she knows how to do that is to kill a bunch of them. You are one crew, or you are the enemy of one crew. Choose. You are one crew, or you are the enemy of one crew. Choose. You are one crew, or you are the enemy of one crew. Choose. You are one crew, or you are the enemy of one crew. 
We then see all the clans bowing and showing all of their support for her before Jaha opens the doors. He gets the doors open, Octavia and the rest of the grounders raid and lock Kara up along with the other girlies that attempted the coup. Meanwhile, Octavia, Abby, and Kane go downstairs to find Jaha. Jaha dies. So we do see here Jaha has died and I want to talk about this just really quick because Jaha as a character I feel like deserves his own video because he was just he was insane. Let's just speak on it. I think the fans as a whole, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I feel like the fans as a whole despised him and did not want him to be in the show anymore. Also, the actor has a past of homophobia on the set of Grey's Anatomy and I think one other show, but I could be wrong. And so I think they realized that they had to cut one of their main characters. Obviously, the one that has a past of being homophobic and is like a known Republican on your liberal leaning show would be the choice. So I think they decided that he would probably be the one to go. Um, I think it was announced before season five came out that he wouldn't be returning. I'm not entirely sure if he got fired from this show because of homophobia or if they just knew that he had a past with it so they uh kind of cut the cord before anything could happen isaiah washington has some interesting political views much like jaha himself along with indra and gaia's instruction they basically tell her to leave the blood on her when she goes and gives her speech to the prisoners octavia gives a speech and the prisoners are brought out, including Kara. Octavia says that everybody has a chance to fight for their life and whoever wins this conclave will survive. And this is their form of population control. Like anybody who breaks the law, they'll be put in a fighting pit with a couple other people. We eventually see Kara wins and then we get a flash forward to the present day. So six years later pops up on the screen and we see the scene again where everybody is watching the battle happening in the pit. And all of a sudden, Gaia calls calls out for the guards to bring in the next group of competitors and who happens to be in this new group of competitors? Why, Marcus Kane. So Marcus Kane has been found guilty of something, clearly, because now we know that the fighting pits are used to reduce population for anyone that breaks the law. At the beginning of the episode, we see Clark is found by the Allegis girlies. She is tied up by Dioza. Meanwhile, we see Space Crew arrives on the Allegis mothership up in space. Space Crew find out that the rest of the 300 hundred Allegis prisoners are in cryo sleep, which I think I mentioned earlier. This basically means that nobody else on the ship is awake. We see the prisoners are interrogating Clark and she is pretending that she doesn't know English, much like Lincoln did in season one when they were the prisoners who were interrogating a grounder. Clark is very much now the grounder and these are very much the delinquents. We see that Murphy, Monty, and Echo move the hydrazine to the ship so that they have enough fuel to get down to the ground. So Raven is looking at the Allegis files and she finds a video, the crew on the Allegis ship getting marooned. And the person that's obviously doing this is Dioza. I think I spoiled it for you earlier. She has all the prisoners killing everybody in the crew and taking over the ship, obviously besides Shaw. We hear over the radio that McCreary and his people have found Maddie, and this frightens Clark, so she eventually speaks up and reveals that she does know English. She basically tells Dioza everything that there is to know about Apocalypse 1 and 2. Back up in space, we see that Murphy and Raven have decided to stay behind on the ship to leverage the sleeping prisoners against against Dioza, while the rest of space crew, including Bellamy, Amori, Monty, Harper and Echo head down to Earth and are found by the prisoners. We then see that Clark is being tortured again by Dioza and her people. Meanwhile, back with Bellamy's group, they are about to be taken prisoner themselves when Maddie arrives and saves them and takes them to Clark at the village. We see that the group arrives to Dioza and Bellamy leverages the sleeping prisoners, which Murphy and Raven could kill at any time because they are still on the mothership in exchange for Clark's freedom. We see Abby in her jail cell and she is begging for somebody to take her instead of Marcus and it's kind of alluded to that she might have broken the law and it wasn't Kane himself. He just like took the fall for it. Then we see Kane in the fighting pits. He actually wins the conclave, but everybody votes like there's some kind of like voting system and Octavia is like the judge and then everyone else is like the jury and if they see 
that he is like ruthless enough with his kills then he'll win and like be free or whatever but because Kane is kind of a softy, he um, has to fight again the next morning. Bellamy has made a deal with Dioza to have her people open the bunker because they have sonic cannons which can pulverize rock. Bellamy and Clark reunite. Bellamy radios Raven and Murphy so that Clark can reunite with them over a phone call essentially. Meanwhile, the girlies all arrive at Polis where Dioza tells McCreary her plan to kidnap Abby to find a cure, a mysterious cure for something mysterious that they have. That's curious. We don't know what that's about yet. We see Octavia talking to Kane, who is still locked up, and he mentions that the Dark Year almost broke them all. And this is the first time we've heard of this, quote, Dark Year. We don't know what that was about, but we will certainly learn about it. Kane basically calls Octavia a dictator because, yeah, she kind of is. Before Kane enters his second conclave, he is able to say goodbye to Abby, who obviously was locked up separately from him. As they're saying goodbye, Abby reveals that she's the one that stole the drugs and it wasn't actually Kane. We learn that Abby might have a little bit of a drug problem. So because Raven is looking through the Allegis files, Allegis 1 was an unmanned mission to the asteroid Proxima 6, which found a Hithalodium mine. Allegis 2 was a manned mission to that asteroid. However, it failed because they didn't have enough manpower, which is why they switched to prison labor for Allegis 4. We also learned that the third Allegis mission has a huge encryption code on it so that no one else can see it. So that's mysterious. We don't know what happened to Allegis 3 or what it was even about. And then obviously Allegis 4 was the prison mining mission to that asteroid, which eventually had Dioza's maroon and subsequent return to Earth here in the present day. We see during Kane's second conclave, he refuses to fight, which angers Octavia. She comes down the stairs as if she's about to execute him. All of a sudden, the Allegis girlies come through and they do drill through the bunker and are able to enter the bunker. This is a really good emotional scene. Oh my gosh. And we see that the bunker is finally opened here in episode four. We see Bellamy and Octavia reunite and it's a really, really, really emotional scene. So we learn here that one crew's numbers have gone down from 1200 to 814. Clark reunites with Abby, who obviously is now pardoned essentially because they are all going to be making it out of this bunker, so their crimes don't really mean as much. Although Octavia remains really salty about this, she hasn't really given a word on these two yet about if they're going to be free people. So I wanted to talk about this just briefly here. The reunions in this season are so weird. They're like heartwarming and nice and sweet at first, but there's like this underlying tone of the characters not trusting each other. And there's a good reason for that because they're completely different than they were six years prior. Specifically, Bellamy and Octavia have a really weird moment after Bellamy looks around at the blood all over the walls and then looks at Octavia's outfit that she's in. He's very much giving judgmental older brother here. Like he is not approving of her lifestyle and how she's chosen to lead in the last six years, which I mean, how could he really understand when he's had a really good time with his like chosen family up in space? There's other reunions like Abby and Clark, and those are a little bit more sentimental. However, they're always cut short and they feel just a little bit off. But I did just want to talk about that really quick because the reunions feel very strange for good reason. And I think they do a really good job at demonstrating how different the characters are in just six years. It's really awkward though, because the people who are actually getting one crew out of this bunker are Dioza and the rest of the Allegis crew. So Octavia makes it very clear that she does not trust them. They are prisoners and she is just like, this is just another faction that we're gonna end up going to war with. We see that Dioza has Shaw opening the docking bay doors so that Raven and Murphy up in the mothership would die, which would get rid of their leverage. In response to this though, the crafty Raven opens all of the cryopods, which wakes everybody up and forces Dioza to close the docking bay doors. But now they have 300 prisoners staring at them. After everyone is removed from the bunker, we see Dioza, she demands Abby. Abby goes willingly for some reason because obviously she is still hated by Octavia and Kane goes along with her. So these two defect to Allegis. The Allegis crew basically make it clear that they are taking the shallow valley. Here are my terms. The valley is ours. 
somebody shoots at Octavia and tries to assassinate her, but he misses and ends up shooting one of Octavia's people. Alright, so I'm finally going to explain the timeline of the first four episodes. So in the present day, the first episode, the third episode, and then like the first few scenes of episode four all take place on April 7th. And then the rest of episode four takes place on April 8th of 2156. Now the flashbacks take place anywhere in May of 2150. And then the bunker flashbacks also take place during that time period as well. So we see Octavia and the war chiefs of one crew discussing how to get past the dead zone into Shallow Valley. Because remember, they have like 200 miles of desert to walk through. And Clark has made this trip dozens of times. So she offers her expertise in the subject to Octavia and they all leave to go walk through the desert. Meanwhile, back in the village, Abby and Kane are making themselves at home in Clark's house at the Shallow Valley Village, because obviously Dioza and her people have taken over the village at this point. Dioza reveals that half the prisoners are suffering some kind of illness, and Abby has to treat all of them because Dioza saved her life from Octavia, essentially. And we see her first patient is Michael Vincent. Vincent? Put the scalpel down. Keep your hands and feet away from his mouth and you should be fine. So she meets Michael Vinson. After days of being in the dead zone, Bellamy and Clark are about to head to bed and they talk about how different Octavia is and how Bellamy just can't seem to get through to her. Meanwhile, we also see Octavia and Indra eating together. Octavia says that love is a weakness. Your brother loves you, Octavia. Love is a weakness. It isn't nonsense. Love no one. No one can hurt you. I love you. Does that make me weak? I would never say that to you, said it. This kind of gags Octavia just a little bit. She's a little bit gagged and gooped by this because this is her teacher who taught her that love was weakness in the first place. Now Indra believes that Octavia might have gone a little bit far. But now we know where Indra stands on the whole Octavia being a dictator thing. Since one crew is here in the fallout, there are many unexpected challenges that they have to deal with. One of them being a parasitic worm that invades your body and eats you alive. So there's that. One of the one crew warriors accidentally steps on nest of them, I guess, and it gets in his leg and then eats him alive. We see that Raven is getting tortured by Paxton McCreary because she allegedly locked them out of their missile system to protect one crew from getting bombed in the desert. However, Shaw reveals to Raven and Murphy that it was him that did it, and he's just letting them get tortured for something that he did. We see that Shaw is not necessarily that bad of a guy, and he sympathizes with Raven. Basically, the two kind of team together, and they break Murphy out. He runs as far away as he can from the village. Meanwhile, Abby begins suffering withdrawals because her pills were taken away from her. We see Murphy is found by Amori and Echo and Maddie and the others. Meanwhile, in the desert, we do see that the grounder that had the worms in him does die. All the worms escape his body and then go out and try to attack everyone else. We see his stomach basically like explode and worms fly everywhere. A worm gets in Octavia's arm before Indra torches the tent that the worms are in, which kills all of them. We see Clark having to remove the worm from Octavia's arm, which is just excruciatingly gory. Meanwhile, we see Monty radio Bellamy and tell him about the eye in the sky, which he learned about from Murphy, who was just at camp with the girlies. This allows one crew to abandon the camp which is bombed by Dioza and her people. Where do they move? Into a sandstorm. See Dioza and Kane having a drink together as they discuss uh, what is to come. We see Monty's group arrive to one crew where Monty says hi to Octavia in that really awkward like waving scene. We see Clark reunite with Maddie. As the girlies arrive, we see Bellamy reuniting with Echo, and they kiss right in front of Octavia, who is still a little bit bitter about the fact that she banished Echo, and she had absolutely no idea that Bellamy saved Echo's life during Prime Fire. 
So she's she's a little bit she's a little bit salty about her brother literally dating the enemy, according to her. And that's where episode five ends. So this episode takes place from April 9th to April 12th. We see that everyone in one crew has returned to Polis. Clark is cleaning Octavia's wounds. So as Clark is cleaning Octavia's wounds, we see Octavia and Clark aren't exactly the most trusting of each other anymore. Clark is very hesitant with information around Octavia. It's really funny because it's like they used to be at least cordial to each other. And now Clark is like, I'm not going to let my daughter anywhere near you. She's not like forward about it. Like they're very much hiding their distaste for each other. Clark does not want Octavia to know that Maddie is a real nightblood because if Octavia were to know that, she might feel as though Maddie is a potential adversary or potentially going to take her spot as the leader of one crew because a real nightblood would be able to unite the clans probably more than Octavia could. We see Bellamy and Echo confronting Octavia who just ends up banishing Echo again because she doesn't want to hear anything from these two about the whole situation. Oh yeah, we see these like crates of food drop from the sky. They are from the Allegis prisoners who are recruiting one crew members to defect from one crew. Over in intercom, we hear Dioza say that all members of one crew are welcome in the valley as long as they defect from Octavia. So it's getting spicy, it's getting spicy. Octavia then changes her mind about Echo and offers her a job to go into Shallow Valley as one of the defectors to spy on the girlies and give intel to Octavia on the whole Allegis situation. Meanwhile, back in the woods, I think I forgot to mention, Amori stayed behind with John because John's shot collar was basically like geographically tagged to go off whenever he tries to leave. He had to stay behind last episode with Amori. We see her trying to take his collar off in a cave. We see Nyla finally reunite with Clark and she questions Clark about Maddie being a true Nightblood. She has a theory that Maddie is a true Nightblood and Clark is just denying this profusely because she doesn't want anybody thinking that Maddie could possibly take power away from Octavia. And because Nyla is an Octavia loyalist, she is considered dangerous by Clark, even though they used to be like girlfriends. It's so weird that everyone's relationship is just so much different this season. And we see Gaia overhears this conversation and because Gaia is a flame fanatic, she knocks Nyla out and tries to have a conversation with Clark about, about Maddie and her potential to be her new commander because obviously Gaia, like I said before, is a flame fanatic. So she is trying to make a new commander essentially. That's her job. Octavia lets Echo defect to take down the eye in the sky at the village. Meanwhile, Amori and John are found by McCreary and his people, but Amori is able to make like a bomb or something out of John's collar and they use it to kill all of his people. Then they take McCreary prisoner in this cave where they are. Clark is all kinds of paranoid about the whole Maddie situation, so she tries to take Maddie out and she tries to defect back to the valley with Maddie. However, Maddie runs away because she does not want to defect. She wants to be a part of one crew, so she runs to Octavia and tells Octavia the truth about her being a real Nightblood, which earns Octavia's trust. We're a little bit unsure if Octavia is going to actually keep her word about keeping Maddie safe or if she's going to keep her close and then kill her. We see Cooper, and I think I forgot to mention, she's like upgraded to being Octavia's like second in command, essentially. Basically, she changed a lot in the six years that she was in that bunker, and she is now fully behind Octavia. Anyway, we see her shooting defectors and Bellamy is like, girl, what the fuck? I thought you were gonna let them all go because she told Echo that she would. However, she said that she was just going to let Echo go and the rest of the defectors were gonna get shot because they're traitors. Meanwhile, we see Echo has made it to the valley uh, with the Allegis prisoners and she has the drive that is going to be used to take down the eye in the sky. And she hides it in one of the defectors' gunshot wounds. I mean, Slay, she kind of mothered there just a little bit, if I'm being honest with you. So episode six takes place on April 13th 
2156. At the village, we see Dioza telling the defectors that they have to earn their place in the village and they have to be a functioning part of their little community. We see Kane confronting Abby, who failed to perform surgery on one of the defectors and basically let her bleed out because she is without her pills. Kane grows increasingly disappointed in Abby and her pill usage. It's here that we finally see Clark give Jasper's suicide note to Monty, obviously Monty's best friend Jasper. Clark and Monty find Cooper and she is down in the hydro farm hiding something. So they go in and see what it is. And it turns out that they're using the bodies of the defectors to breed those worms back from like episode five to literally use as a weapon on the Allegis prisoners, and they're using the bodies of the defectors to breed them. Meanwhile, back at the village, we see Raven reuniting with Echo. We see Monty, Clark, and Bellamy talk to Indra, who seems to be the most trustworthy person in one crew for them at the moment. And apparently Indra had no idea about the whole worms being bred situation that, that Cooper is doing. We see that Gaia is having Maddie train because she is now part of one crew. So she trains with Ethan, who was Jaha's kid back, well not Jaha's kid, but the kid that Jaha was looking after. And Clark tells Maddie to hold back because Clark can't have Gaia thinking that Maddie could make a real commander or else there could be some kind of struggle for power. So Clark wants Maddie to hold back and show as much weakness as possible. Clark, Bellamy, Indra, and Monty learn that the worms was Octavia's idea. That was not Cooper's idea, it was Octavia's idea. And that is just another layer to her character that Bellamy wasn't expecting. Apparently, Octavia didn't know that Cooper was experimenting on live humans, and she thought that Cooper was just putting them in dead defectors, not live ones. But Cooper claims that she found that the worms reproduced in a live body three times faster than in a dead one, so Octavia approves the human testing. We see that Echo in the village earns Dioza's trust by telling Dioza that Shaw was the one that locked out the missile system. And Echo only does this to get her and Raven on to the ship to take the eye down. So while Raven is proving that to Dioza, Echo is putting that drive in the ship, which is what takes the eye in the sky down. Obviously Raven is a little upset that Echo did this behind her back because Raven all of a sudden has to go along with this plan. And obviously Raven and Shaw are kind of like buddy buddy now, so. He ends up getting tortured by his own people, or I guess by the prisoners that he has to fly around. We see Dioza come in for an appointment with Abby, and it is revealed that Dioza is pregnant, and she's not actually sick at all like the other girlies. She's pregnant, so there's that. Octavia sees that Maddie does well against Ethan, so she makes her her second, which is just the nightmare of Clark. Clark is absolutely against this. She does not want Maddie to be a part of one crew, and the closer she gets to Octavia, the more it looks like to Clark that Octavia is going to kill Maddie. It's getting good, guys. It's getting really good. This is such a good episode, by the way. And at the end of the episode, the eye is obviously finally taken down, but Clark disconnects the radio that it's attached to, to talk to Dioza. So episode seven takes place on April 14th, 2156 and April 15th, 2156. At the beginning of the episode, we see Clark trying to make a deal with Dioza for a one crew surrender. Dioza decides that she would let one crew live in the valley if one crew did surrender. Meanwhile, in the caves with Murphy, Amori, and their prisoner, McCreary, Murphy tries to make a deal with Dioza for Raven in exchange for McCreary, because obviously Raven is still a prisoner there. However, Dioza sees this as cutting her losses because McCreary is kind of a threat to her power because McCreary has a bunch of supporters and she has a bunch of supporters in the group of prisoners. So as soon as McCreary's gone, all of McCreary's people become her people. So she just lets McCreary die. Oh, we see Abby discovers along with the help of Vincent that sound waves are the thing that cure this mysterious illness. It's like big abscesses in their lungs from mining hephalodium. So she learns that sound waves are the thing that is going to save it. Vincent suggests that they use the sonic drill, the sonic 
Canon thing to reverse engineer it into a machine in order to get rid of the abscesses in everyone's lungs. We learned that Echo wants to kill Shaw. She tells Raven her plan to kill Shaw, and Raven is against this because obviously Raven and Shaw are friends. That would take away the prisoner's ability to fly into space. They already got Shaw tortured, and she is buddy-buddy with Shaw. Um, well, I guess not anymore. He's upset at the fact that um, she turned him in. Bellamy and Clark try to get Indra to join them in destroying the worms. We finally see Abby reunite with Raven. Abby lies to Raven and says that she's being blackmailed by Dioza to cure all of the prisoners in order for her to live, but it's really about her and her drugs and Dioza keeping Abby on a leash, essentially. Raven agrees to help Abby build this machine to cure everyone. We see Bellamy and Clark stage Cooper's death as an accident due to the worms, which also kills all the worms. So it's here that we see Raven trying to destroy the machine that she just built for Abby. Abby takes the shock collar remote control and shocks Raven. This is one of the craziest turns, I guess, for a character this season, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's unjustified because as we know, Abby is an addict and when you are on drugs, you aren't exactly in control of yourself. You are almost like a whole different person. I think she just got a lot of unnecessary hate and I don't think people really took into consideration the fact that she was um, an addict. We see Indra sounding the alarm to Cooper's death. Obviously Indra knows about these two but is choosing to keep it a secret because she agrees with Bellamy and Clark that the worms would destroy the valley and she wants somebody to see the end of this war. However, Octavia knows that they staged Cooper's death because even Cooper knew that the plan wasn't even to use the worms. It was to use the worms eggs and they already loaded them. So they still have the worms eggs that they can use on the valley. This is when Octavia arrests Clark but spares Bellamy. We see that Abby's machine works and she's able to use it on Vincent. Oh my gosh, I forgot to mention. Murphy and Amori pretend to be McCreary's prisoners to get McCreary back into camp. Murphy and Amori make a deal with McCreary to get him back in control of his people back in the village. In return, McCreary promises to free Raven and Echo and all of Murphy's people. However, when they walk back into the village, McCreary has them locked up with Raven and Echo. And with McCreary arriving back to camp, Dioza tells Abby to hide the machine so that none of McCreary's people get cured. And at the end of the episode, we see Bellamy joining Octavia for dinner. He uses Monty's algae to poison Octavia's bar, which puts her in a temporary coma. So the entirety of episode 8 takes place on April 15th of 2156. At the village, we see Murphy and Echo and Raven and others plan to turn the Allegis girlies against each other because as we know, McCreary has just recently returned and these two have a lot of animosity towards each other. Bellamy sees Clark who is locked up and he tells Clark that he poisoned his sister. Clark is a little bit shook by this. So with Octavia in a coma, Indra tries to announce to one crew that she's taking control of the 1st Battalion. However, just episodes ago, Octavia gave that honor to Miller. Miller, Indra, and also Brell all argue about who should be in control. Brell believes that the clan delegates should reassemble and choose their next leader. Nathan believes that he should just lead it himself. Bellamy then tells Clark that the only other option at this point is to use Maddie to unite one crew, which is kind of on the verge of splitting up into its own clans again, because obviously Octavia is in a coma, so there's nobody to lead them, and they won't follow Indra, so the clans look like they're about to break up again. We see Murphy stirs the pot with McCreary. He tells him that Dioza and Abby found a cure, and this pisses him off. We see Bellamy and Indra have Gaia put the flame in Maddie's head, which goes against Clark's wishes. We then see Indra barricade herself in the room with Octavia, who is waking up from her coma. That was a very short coma. It was like one day. Meanwhile, back at the village, Dioza and McCreary's people start fighting each other because I think Murphy throws a rock at one of them, like, and so... They go to war, these two girlies, while they're all distracted, Amori slips all of their collars off and they plan to make an escape along with Kane, 
but Kane reveals to them that Clark already negotiated with Dioza to let them live peacefully in the valley, so this kind of just fucked their whole chances up because now the prisoners are at war with each other. There's going to be a war regardless because McCreary's people are gonna end up being in charge at this point. So Dioza slashes McCreary's throat, but he ends up surviving, and his people take Abby. This allows Dioza to slip out with Kane and the space crew girlies, and they leave the village, which is now uh, overrun with McCreary followers. Back in Polis, Indra reveals that she blames herself for what Octavia has become. We see Nyla freeing Clark from her prison. Clark arrives to Octavia to try and assassinate her for some reason, even though she knows that Bellamy is the one who is planning this coup on Octavia. She's planning on giving Bellamy what he wants, essentially. However, Clark then decides to negotiate with Octavia to let them leave in order to stop Maddie's ascension which is something that they both want. And then we see Bellamy, Indra, and Gaia are arrested by Octavia, which allows Clark her freedom from Octavia. So Clark and Maddie are taken to the rover to leave. It's revealed that the guard that takes them to the rover was given specific orders from Octavia to kill them. However, Clark ends up killing this guy first and takes Maddie the hell out of Dodge. So this episode takes place on April 16th and 17th of 2156. We see Clark and Maddie are in the desert and they discover that the worm eggs are in their car. So Clark tosses them out into the dead zone again. Meanwhile, back in Polis, Indra talks to Octavia in her jail cell and she claims that she is going to give her life to Gaia when all three of them are placed in the fighting pits. Because Octavia does not want them to die. She just feels like she has to pit them against each other because that is what one crew is used to. That's been their way for the last six years, so she thinks she has to. So she asks Monty to go to Bellamy and try to tell him about Indra's weakness, because obviously Octavia would rather have a brother than her friend Indra. Meanwhile, with Clark and Maddie, because Maddie has the flame in her head, I think I forgot to mention that, the flame is now like combining with her brain and she starts having memories and nightmares. With the flame in Maddie's head, Maddie begins to see dreams and like memories of past commanders, one of them being a memory of Becca's, and this memory is Becca's death. It is revealed that Becca was burned alive at the stake by none other than Bill Cadigan. What a crossover, what a crossover. We will get some more insight on that in a later season. All you need to know is that the creator of the second Dawn Bunker killed the woman who created the AI, that being Allie, if you have any memory of that. Octavia finally confronts her brother and tells him Indra's weakness, which is her arm. Her performance this episode is slaying so hard. Like, I would really recommend you go and watch this show. Specifically this season, she is absolutely mothering this episode. Back in the village, we see Vinson is instructed by Abby to steal her meds from McCreary, who, who, like I said before, is now in control of the village. We see Vincent go crazy and kill the guards that are watching Abby, and Abby is so out of her mind going through withdrawal. So she takes a bunch of pills and overdoses. Meanwhile, back in Polis, Bellamy, Gaia, and Indra fight in the pits. Gaia throws the staff all the way up to Octavia on the top floor. However, Octavia just throws the staff back down and says that that's just not going to work. However, then Harper and Monty arrive in the pits and claim that they have a way to grow food here in the Hydra Farm, which was on its last legs. Monty, because he is a super genius, was able to grow a flower, which turns into fruit. He believes that he can like regrow the forest around them in Polis, which is going to take a long time, girl, but he remains hopeful and he gives this speech to everybody and everybody's so happy. Octavia ends up getting booed and so she walks away from the pit and decides to give her people no choice. She goes to the farm and burns the whole thing down. Oh my gosh, this forces all of one crew to follow her and not Monty. This is one of her most questionable decisions, but also you can't help but love her. Like, I can't help but love her, but I know that there were people that were 
pissed. Because Octavia has burned the farm, one crew has no other option but to follow Octavia into the desert to try and get to the valley. And they only have like six days worth of rations, so they all need to like hurry their asses up. The next six days, they are going to be marching through the desert. We see Clark and Maddie arrive at the village where they finally find Abby and Clark learns of Abby's addiction because Abby is like passed out and she sees pills all around her. So this episode takes place solely on April 18th, 2156 with the flashback taking place sometime in October of 2054. So this episode is titled The Dark Year, and we've kind of heard a little bit about The Dark Year. This takes place on March 27th and March 28th, 2152. So it's two years after Prime Faya back in season four. Octavia has taken control of her people. However, they learn that the crops are not gonna sustain them for the amount of time that they need to survive. The council basically comes to the decision that they need to start eating each other and the source being the fighting pits. So anybody that is arrested and convicted of a crime, uh, whoever dies will basically become the food for the rest of the people in the bunker. Kane rejects the food, but Abby basically convinces Octavia to break Kane by executing people in front of him who aren't willing to eat. Eat. I'm sorry, I can't. This isn't a choice. One of the men in the arena yesterday was my brother. And he gave his life so you could live. You are one crew. You are an enemy of one crew. Choose. Just take a bite. Eat or die. No, stop. Shut up. I'll eat. We eventually see McCreary find Clark, who is saving her mom still. Clark then decides to make a deal with McCreary to heal his people with Abby in order to keep them safe. We see Echo warn Bellamy over the radio that McCreary's people know that one crew is on their way. We also see Clark has finished detoxing Abby. Abby tells Clark about the whole dark year situation that they had to go through. We see Murphy, Raven, Echo, and Amori, they arrive at one of the entrances to the valley to, to kill the guards so that one crew can enter. Octavia agrees to allow an Allegis surrender per Bellamy's terms. Over the course of the next four or five days, Abby heals all of McCreary's people in preparation for battle while one crew walks all the way through the desert to the valley. Raven and Shaw kiss, so they are a romantic item now. And because Kane and Dioza are so scared of Octavia entering the valley, they betray Space Crew and walk into the village to warn McCreary. So the flashbacks for episode 11 take place in March of 2152, which is two years after Prime Fire. And then the present day storyline takes place from April 18th to April 24th, 2156. At the beginning of the two part finale, we see one crew has entered the valley. So due to the fact that McCreary's people were warned by Dioza and Kane, one crew is shot down by Sonic Kane cannons and Octavia and Bellamy are forced to play dead otherwise they will get killed as soon as they start moving. We see Clark trying to take the flame out of Maddie but Maddie changes the passphrase. Maddie is very upset that Clark betrayed her friends and is working with McCreary of all people. This is one of her most questionable decisions. Mm -hmm. Back at one crew's camp just outside the valley, Miller and Brell argue about who is to lead one crew now that Octavia was left behind in the gorge. They find Indra together and we learn that Gaia was shot. Meanwhile, Murphy, Echo, and Raven arrive to, to try to kidnap Maddie, but Maddie is like, I'll just go with you willingly because Maddie kind of wants to lead one crew now that she is commander, she just like instinctively knows what to do. Clark ends up finding them. So she radios McCreary and has the rest of her friends locked up yet again to protect them from kidnapping Maddie. Oh, Clark, the flop that you are in this season. We then see Vincent attacking Kane because he felt somewhat useful with Abby. And now that she is clean, he feels as though if he kills Kane, Abby will somehow step off the ledge again and he can be useful again to her 
which is just the most backwards way of thinking. But he tries to kill Kane. He stabs him like 45 times with a screwdriver. And then Abby runs in and uses the shock collar on Vincent and kills him. Mm -hmm. The bitch, the bitch is dead. I also did forget to put a cross on Cooper, so there's that. But yeah, also Vincent has just died. Echo and Maddie persuade Clark to let them leave and head for the front and Clark then decides to maybe listen to her daughter. So then she betrays McCreary's people, and this is, at this point, like her fifth betrayal. Meanwhile, back at the front, we see Octavia decide that she needs to sacrifice herself in order to save her brother, mentor Indra, and Indra's daughter, Gaia. However, before she can sacrifice herself, Echo and the rest of Space Crew and Maddie arrive to rescue all of them and they are taken back to one crew's camp just outside of the village. So Space Crew, Octavia, and Maddie arrive to the one crew camp just outside of the battlefield. Everyone looks around at Maddie because she is their commander and she doesn't give a speech or anything. Everybody just starts bowing to her, including Octavia. So that's some character growth right there. We see Jackson working on closing up Gaia because she was shot back at the front. We see her guiding Maddie to listen to the commanders in her head, which will tell her what to do in order to lead her people into battle now that she is the commander. Meanwhile, back at camp, Shaw and Raven are tortured because one of them needs to fly the ship and they're both refusing to. We then see Clark break into Dioza's cell and she frees her and Dioza's like, it's hard to keep track of what side you're on. And Clark's like, I guess we have that in common. Because yeah, both of them do change sides like 50 times this season. We see Clark use Dioza's baby as leverage because McCreary is the father. And if Clark shoots the baby, McCreary obviously will lose his child. So because Clark is threatening McCreary's baby, we see McCreary, he opens Dioza's book and looks up some um, nuclear launch codes. There is a nuke on board. It's not necessarily a nuke. It's like a hithalodium bomb that will destroy the valley. And he launches it from the mothership down to the valley because if he can't have this valley, no one else can. So Apocalypse 3 is on. It is go time for the girlies. And then Clark runs over to McCreary because there's just... There's nothing they can do besides kill him at this point. So she stomps on his face and he dies, but we don't actually see his dead body. So it is then when we see one crew marching led by Maddie and they enter the valley again. And as soon as they make it to the village, uh, the Allegis prisoners surrender, which one crew accepts. However, they don't get to celebrate winning the valley for too long. In fact, literally probably like 30 seconds because then Mother Raven right here announces over the intercom that Prime Fire 3 is a go and everybody needs to get their ass to the ship because there is a missile headed towards them. So everybody makes it onto the ship, including one crew, the Allegis prisoners, and obviously space crew girlies all make it there as well. So the fact that they have this like third apocalypse situation going on, I will say it's a bit repetitive. And when I watched this for the first time, I was like, what? where is there to go? Because at this point, they had already announced that they were going to get another season. So I was like, what are they going to do for season six? Like, it's just going to be Allegis and one crew again. Like, there's no new group of people. Because season five felt so big, what else can they do? But we'll start to see them bring up the idea of cryosleep. And because Earth will not be back anytime soon, they're going to have to wait this out for a while. While on the ship, the group has a meeting the main character girlies all have a meeting about what to do next and Shaw suggests that they go into cryo because there is just no way that they're going to be able to survive. They don't have any food or water on this ship, at least not enough to survive 10 years, which is the rumor about how long this is going to last. We also get a quick scene where Octavia and Dioza settle their differences and they have a little chat about what it's like to be a leader. We see Clark saying goodnight to Maddie, Bellamy saying goodnight to Octavia, and he says that he can't quite forgive her yet because she literally caused all this to happen along with Dioza. So Clark and Bellamy wake up from the long nap. They look around and they are the only ones awake and they're a little bit confused. They're a little bit kerfuffled. There's a man that introduces himself to them and this man says his name is Jordan Green. Hold up, we know somebody named Monty Green. He claims that Monty and Harper 
didn't end up taking the long nap, ended up growing old together and having this kid named Jordan, which kind of makes sense because back in like episode 10, I think Monty and Harper said that they were just done fighting and they didn't want to be a part of these wars anymore. So, I mean, in character, it makes sense, but also like, why would you want to leave your friends behind? But this kid Jordan shows them like this compilation of videos of his dad and his mom growing old together and um, also Monty informs Bellamy and Clark about the fact that Earth it's it's not coming back it's not coming back we see them as Jordan has been put to sleep he's about 25 I think he's around Bellamy and Clark's age now so he's essentially their age but he's grown up alone so he's essentially a child and has like no social skills but anyway Monty and Harper put him to sleep so that he can be with the rest of everyone when they all wake up we learn that Harper died of her dad's genetic condition. Monty lived out the rest of his days alone. However, before he did kick the bucket, he was able to crack the Allegis 3 mission file, which just so happened to be a mission to an Earth-like planet. So it is revealed here that season six is going to take place on planet Alpha. Bellamy and Clark open the window and they look out at this new planet. It looks similar to Earth. They then hug each other and look out into the distance and then the season fades to black. Before it does, it says end book one, which is an interesting choice because book one of the series doesn't actually have anything to do with them going to a new planet. So I think it's just part one of the series is over and it like closes the first chapter of this book that is the hundred, not necessarily the hundred book series. So as for the timeline of these two episodes, it takes place on April 24th, 25th, and 26th, 2156. And then when Bellamy and Clark wake up, it is 125 years later. That's how long they were asleep, 125 years. So it's now 2281. Yes, 2281. Mm -hmm. This is like the most unhinged show. I'm not even going to lie. All right, so this is the state of the board as of season five. There is a lot of people dead. There's more dead people than there are alive people, I think, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. This show has now killed more people off than are alive currently in the show. So um, yeah, we'll see in season six, Monty's message about trying to do better is really taken seriously and not wanting to kill people and going to war with people it becomes a lot more prominent next season. So yeah, we'll see some new factions arise, some crazy little plot twists, some crazy new additions to the cast as well. Obviously, we have already gotten a tease. Uh, Monty and Harper's son, who I haven't put on the board yet, but he'll go somewhere around them, probably like right there. But yeah, that is the state of the board as of season five. And with that, we learned that everyone on the mothership is going to get introduced to a whole new cast of characters next season, which I am very excited to break down for you in the next part. So yeah, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I think that's all I really have to say about this season. I don't know how long this video is going to end up being. I've had to re-record this part of the video because my hair looked absolutely atrocious in the first one, so I decided to re-record this. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!